Good morning, Christ Community Church. Thanks for watching our online service. This has been pre-recorded, and I have invited several members of the worship team to send a song in so to help lead us into worship. And one of the songs Russ and Rachel sent were, was is a song called uh, Graves into Gardens, and I want us as a church to learn this. And it comes from Isaiah 61, which paints a, which paints a picture of Jesus. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you turn graves into gardens and that you bring beauty from the ashes in our lives. And Father, I thank you that we can participate in the life of Christ and we can participate in the body of Christ and we can participate in the work of God in this time, in this land, Father. And I ask you to show us who you are this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough.
to be 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself, so that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Give us purity of heart and strength of purpose, that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will, no weakness keep us from doing it, that in your light we may see light clearly, and in your service find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. I hope that you are doing well. It is uh, Friday morning, um, May 29th, and if all goes as planned, uh, this will be the sermon that we will air on May 31st in just a few days. I uh, just want to give you a quick update. Um, I talked to my doctor yesterday. She said that I've met all the CDC guidelines and her uh, expectations to consider myself fully recovered from COVID-19. Uh, I am just waiting for the results of that final COVID test that will come back by Monday that will confirm that um, uh, I test negative for COVID and I am a um, COVID survivor or recoverer or whatever it is that uh, you might um, call it. Uh, I apologize if I use my hands to talk a little bit and this little thing is obnoxiously in the way. Uh, although I survived COVID like a champ, uh, I will have to admit that um, I'm a bit uh, less brave when it comes to lacerations of my digits, and I uh, cut my hand on a vegetable cutter last night, but uh, I will conquer that as well. Uh, 
Also, just uh, very quickly, I wanted to let you know that the elders and the staff, we are praying, we are seeking wisdom and consultation to put together our, our plan for soon um, slowly reopening the church. It's going to look a little different than we thought that it was going to look. We, 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 you know, we, we thought maybe we, we would have this time of, of social distancing and then go back to business as normal. That's not exactly what's going to happen. And I just want to clarify something in, in case there's any misunderstanding. Uh, we, we are looking to the CDC guidelines. We are looking to the uh, local and state government guidelines. Uh, I've been dialoguing with city officials. Uh, and, and we are certainly looking to those guidelines to understand what they recommend. But our goal is not simply to find the letter of the law and seek to comply to the minimal standards that are suggested from, uh, from some particular state, national, or even local government. We, we certainly want to listen and learn, but, but our goal is not to try to meet some minimal standard. Uh, that, that's never been our goal. In fact, minimal expectations has not ever been a value that has driven anything that we've done. Uh, our goal is to listen to these recommendations and also listen to the recommendations of uh, health experts, uh, even among our community, as well as uh, listen to our brothers and sisters in other churches and, and learning from the wisdom of, of what they're processing and what they're discovering so that we can find a best course of action that allows us to fulfill our responsibility to safeguard the health and safety of our community, particularly those who are more vulnerable than others. And so, so, so that's, that's the goal here. And, and so if, if we, we come up with a plan and, and maybe it, it's, it's, it is um, a little more cautious than what you read on some website or a Facebook post, by all means, you're welcome to share that with us. But, but again, our goal isn't just to find the minimal letter of the law. Uh, our goal is to be optimal in making sure we're we're being responsible, being responsible with our community, uh, with the information that we have. That being said, as you all know, we're, there's no way that you can make a decision and make everyone happy. Uh, some some folks will be frustrated that it's taken this long for us to reopen, and others are still going to be concerned and cautious that we are opening this soon. And we just want to say we welcome everyone's opinion and we want to hear your concerns and certainly they we will factor those into uh, our process but both perspectives have a point to that, that that is worthy to be made and worthy to be heard and so we, we are not going to choose uh, sides and, and divide over this issue we were going to be um, sensitive to everyone's concerns and do the best that we can uh, for our community. And I assure you that in the end, we are going to do our best to do what seems good to us and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So if you will pray for us and be patient with us, we would appreciate it. And you will be hearing more about those plans in the upcoming weeks. So today we are going to talk about, um, uh, um, we're going to do kind of follow a meditation on Matthew 25. I've been spending some of this time in isolation and um, quarantine, which has been officially lifted. Um, but I've been spending that time thinking over familiar passages, things that have spoken to me in the past. And so this morning we're going to look at two different places. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 4 and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. If you were on our mailing list, I went ahead and put the full text in the notes so that you can follow along. Or, of course, you can grab your Bible and just, you know, put a bookmark in Matthew 25 because that's where we're going to end. But we're going to start in Genesis chapter 4 because, again, I, I, I think it's important to see how the, the, the themes of the Bible interrelate and connect with one another. And, and Cain is going to ask a question in Genesis chapter 4 that Jesus is going to answer in Matthew chapter 25. And so the title of this morning's teaching is, I am my brother's keeper. And we're going to start uh, before we get to Matthew 25 and Genesis chapter 4, because uh, we're going to look, we're just going to read through this story. It's a story with which we are all familiar. It, of course, is the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, and, and But what, what I want us to really see here is that the text teaches us that Cain failed 
way before his act of violence against his brother. And it was the failure of his way of thinking. It was the failure of his perspective. It was the failure of a false ideology by which Cain was living that allowed him to justify the choices and decisions that led to him acting in violence and committing what the Bible will record as the first murder and the devastating consequences both for the victim and for the one who was responsible for the act of violence. But what I want you to see, what I want us to really see is that there is a perspective, there's an ideology that is behind Cain's thinking that led to his actions. And although we, of course, I would certainly hope are not in the position that we would follow Cain's behavior, we need to be cautious and allow the scriptures to read us and to be open to the Holy Spirit to, to, to use the scriptures to, to speak wisdom into our hearts and to expose uh, if, if we are entertaining the same kind of thinking or ideology that, that um, Cain was listening to that, that allowed him to justify his act of violence and injustice. And whether we are uh, proactively acting on it, or we're just being silent about it, or we're just nursing sinful attitudes in our hearts. We want to be aware of what was Cain's way of thinking that helped justify his actions, and is there a way in which the gospel of Jesus addresses that tendency of the human heart? So, so Genesis chapter 4, let's look at verses 1 through 10. The man, referring to Adam, the man was, and this, this of course happens immediately after Genesis chapter 3, which is the story of um, what, of the so-called fall of mankind. And it's, it's that story in the, um, in the book of Genesis in which Adam and Eve choose to uh, circumvent their vocation of walking in intimacy with God so that they can express their own independence and the devastating consequences that follow. Uh, here we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. The man was intimate with his wife, Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. She also gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of the flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious. He looked despondent. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a lot we could probably unpackage there, but that's, it, it is outside of the context of the teaching that we're looking at today. Um, and so th there's some stuff to dig into. We won't. But of course, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the, the key to understanding this passage is to understand that Abel acted in faith, whereas Cain did not. But that's, again, uh, a teaching for another time. Verse six, uh, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? And why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? So, so we do see here in this narrative that what is happening is a consequences of Cain's choices and that he could have chosen differently and therefore experienced different results. But for our purpose this morning, what we're going to see is not only did he desire a different result, which would have required him to choose differently, but the power to choose differently would have come from his willingness to think differently. And so, so um, let's go back to verse seven. If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Again, with the emphasis being that Cain has a choice of, yes, sin is, 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 has a desire for him, a desire to rule over him, but Cain has uh, the power uh, in God's grace to make a choice to rule over the sin that desires to rule over him. Uh, unfortunately, he does not 
um, respond to this intervention from the Lord. And so we pick up the story in verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Am I my brother's guardian? Or other translation, translations might say, am I my brother's keeper? Obviously, with the title of the teaching, uh, this is the, the translations I'm most familiar with. But I like this idea that the Christian Standard Bible um, chooses to, to interpret this word as guardian. Am I, brother, am I my brother's keeper or am I my brother's guardian? And of course, Cain is asking a rhetorical question that in his mind, the answer is no. Um, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, and, and I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's guardian? Then he said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And again, I want to be very focused in the context of this teaching, but I do think that every discerning follower of Jesus needs to take time to ponder um, this narrative because what we're told here is injustice moves the heart of God. And when there is injustice and blood is spilt, that, that blood cries out from the ground to the Lord of justice who sees all and knows all. And, and so he says to him, uh, your brother's blood is crying from the ground. And he, he, he in fact asked him, you know, wh where, um, where is your brother? So for God's perspective, Cain should have had a position of responsibility for his brother. From Cain's perspective, he didn't know because he's not responsible to be his brother's guardian. Now, this word guardian or, or um, keeper, as some translations might translate it, it, it's this is not the first time in the Bible that this word is used. In fact, what we see is the same word is used in Genesis chapter 2. So I want us to take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and, and here uh, you, you will see it, 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 it has to do with the idea of watching over. It's the same word that's used in um, Genesis 4, um, 4, 9. And in Genesis 2, 15, here's the context in which this word is used. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. So here we see very clearly this idea that this word carries is that, is that the man had a responsibility to take care of God's creation. And what we see in Genesis chapter four is that doesn't just mean the environmental creation, it also means humankind, that, that, that we have this responsibility to be our brother's guardian, our brother's keeper, in that we're supposed to take care of one another and watch out for one another. That, and, and you can see that more clearly in Genesis 2.15. So for Cain, the answer is, I am not my brother's keeper. But for Jesus, the teaching that he reveals and the theme that we see throughout the Gospels and throughout the Gospel teaching of Jesus or the Gospel that Jesus proclaimed, if you will, is the answer is yes. We are our brother's guardian. We are our brother's keeper. And in fact, the most clearly evident, the, the most clear evidence and, and the way in which the authenticity of our faith is manifested is when we worship Jesus by serving other people in need. That, that, that is the theme that we see here in Matthew 25. And so, 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 so what Jesus does is, I mean, he said all along, look, the, the, the commandments uh, crescendo with this, the greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, so we know that the theme of the gospel that Jesus preached is love for God manifested by loving acts of service for our neighbor.
So, so let's take a look here at Matthew chapter 25. And it's, it's a bit of a complex parable. There, there, there are lots of layers to it. There, there are different questions we could ask of the text. There are different angles that we could take in studying the text. And I'm just going to keep it uh, fairly narrow for what we're talking about here. And in particular, the, the way it relates to the attitude that Cain had cultivated that led him to justify the choices that he made. So let's take a look here at Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one, an one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't take care of me. Then they will, too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. They will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, th there are many points that we could that we could that we could dive into about this passage. Like I said, there are many angles and approaches that we could make. Some might want to focus on what it means for the end times. Some might want to focus on what it means for judgment. Uh, some might want to focus on asking difficult questions about the nature of salvation, uh, b because of course this passage doesn't really fit with the typical evangelical narrative of salvation, which emphasizes belief, not so much works. But, but here we see um, that, that, that the, 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 the nature of the judgment is based on how they acted toward other people. It doesn't mean that the other is false. It means that there's some complex conversation that we might have to have about how those two relate. But, but we can't belittle, even though it might make us uncomfortable, the overall theme that is being uh, revealed here in this passage. Uh, another question we might ask is have a discussion about what does it mean to be the least of these? W what I want to do this morning is simply, in the context of jumping out of Genesis chapter 4, is I just want to focus on one simple idea that I think is very clear from this passage, uh, regardless of some of the more complex theological discussions that we could have. And, and it's simply this, this teaching reveals God's intention for how we fulfill our calling to be our brother's keeper. This teaching reveals God's intention for how we fulfill our calling to be our brother's keeper. Take, take a look at the text and let's make some observations. Um, what, what are the actions that are specifically mentioned in the text? Well, uh, the actions that are specifically mentioned in the text are feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, and that has to do not just with saying, hi, how are you, have a scone, uh, that, that is more about practicing hospitality and bringing a, a stranger in and protecting them. Uh, clothing the naked, uh, visiting the sick, and visiting those who are in prison. Th these are the specific actions that are mentioned, but what, what I want you to do is take a look at those six actions and ask yourself, what kind of actions are these? And, and what we could see is that one way of characterizing or uh, categorizing the, this, these six actions is that they are all acts of compassion. 
They are all acts of compassion. Now, I think that's very important when we're, we are opening ourselves up to the wisdom of the Bible. N- number one, is this a comprehensive list? In other words, is, is the, the wisest way to interpret this passage to take these six a- actions and say, okay, these are the six actions that are going to be the standard by which we judge the authenticity of someone's faith. Uh, I, I don't believe that that is the, 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 the point of the passage, and I don't think that that is the wisest way of, of uh, uh, applying its teaching. I don't think that it's necessarily a comprehensive list. I think that the point is that it, it's a description of the kinds of actions that characterize the people of God. It is a description of the kinds of actions that characterize the people of God. And they certainly have a context. I mean, the the idea of hospitality in their context was much more of a life or death situation than acts of hospitality typically are in our context. So so the point isn't the specifics. It is it is it is taking a moment to reflect upon um, how how this list is a description simply of the kinds of actions that characterize the people of God. Another way of saying it would be this, these works are illustrative, not exhaustive. These works are illustrative, not exhaustive. Or we could say these works are representative, not necessarily comprehensive. In other words, other acts of compassion would also be a way of understanding the application of this text. So let's look at these acts of compassion in a general sense and think about how they might apply to us today. First of all, these acts of compassion are not spectacular. And they're not and, and they're even seemingly non-religious. In other words, it wasn't like, oh, we're gonna do friendship. Um, giving water to the, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to do evangelistic giving water to the thirsty. We're going to do evangelistic feeding of the hungry. We're going to do evangelistic clothing of the naked. And the reason why I incentivized the word friendship is that there was a movement a few years ago in the evangelical circles that I was raised in where we would talk about friendship evangelism. I really uh, feel that that concept is not in keeping with the heart of Jesus because the idea was is that you build friendship primarily for the purpose of evangelizing someone. But what we see by these actions that they pursue is that their actions were the end goal in and of themselves. In other words, someone who follows Jesus gives friendship to the lonely simply because they are lonely. And we represent a Lord who is a friend of sinners. We're not using our compassion or our friendship as a way of manipulating a person or manipulating a conversation. Um, it, it is our compassion is the manifestation of the presence of Jesus in and of itself. Now, I am not saying that if that leads to an opportunity to to uh, respond to questions about the hope that you have, that we should shy away from that. That also would be inauthentic because we're not being our true selves. By all means, we should talk about the way the story of Jesus and the gospel shapes our lives. By all means, we should share about the hope that we have because of the forgiveness that we've found in the gospel of Jesus and in the, uh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit that we've experienced that has caused real transformation of our lives. Of course, we share those with folks as they perhaps inquired um, of us and ask questions and so forth, or just even in the context of just being ourselves and speaking about what is most valuable to us. I, I'm not suggesting we don't do that. We certainly do. All I'm saying is this, these, the, these acts of compassion don't seem to be with an agenda. They simply seem to be, this is what we do because we see a need in front of us. The, These acts of compassion, therefore, can be done by anyone, regardless of their spiritual maturity, regardless of their giftedness, or regardless of their financial prosperity. These acts of compassion are not commended by any consideration of their result or pursued by consideration of their result. They they are commended simply because they are done. These acts are not commended or rejected based on the worthiness of those who are receiving them. 
Again, they, they, they help the hungry and the thirsty, the naked and the stranger and the sick and in prison. And maybe people find themselves in those situations because of the consequences of their own misinformed, foolish, or even sinful choices. It doesn't matter. It's not a matter of whether or not they're deserving of the compassion. It is simply that they are in a place where they're experiencing these consequences that are that's creating need in their life, and the people of God respond to that need. Now, a final uh, observation I would like to highlight is that these acts of compassion are not done by intention or program or planning. It's not like they got together and said, let's start a new program, let's start a new ministry, let's start a new activity so that we can meet needs. Again, I'm not saying that those things are wrong. I think that a lot of good can come from those. I just want you to see how practical and simple this lifestyle is. It's not about putting together a program or planning. It's simply the fruit of the Spirit among the people who live by the Spirit. These are not... These are not actions that are intended to make a radical change in the social realities of, of, of the lives of the people that find themselves either victimized uh, by their own choices or by the system or by the circumstance around them. In other words, these acts are not about addressing issues, but simply responding to need. These acts are much more than works. It's not like it's like, okay, I've got to get up and and God wants me to make sure that I do something good for someone today. Now, I think that you can do a lot worse in planning your day. I'm just saying that that's not what's happening here. What I want us to see is that this is the fruit of the gospel in our lives. If, if we've been transformed from the go- by the gospel, th- these are not actions that we have to work hard to plan. This is the fruit that the Spirit will bear in our lives. So these acts are much more than works. They're the natural characteristics of those who are walking in the Spirit. And finally, I would like to make this observation, uh, certainly one that I take away for myself. If these acts are not a part of the fruit of my life, then I need to have some concern over that. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to examine my heart and speak to me and show me what he's wanting to do to take me to my next place of maturity and faithfulness as I follow him. And, and the point then is not just to grit my teeth and try harder. The, 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 the idea is not to strive, not to simply strive for more discipline, but rather my first response begins in the place of prayer that we've been talking about, the secret place of prayer in which I pray, Lord, change my heart and move my hand. And then I get up and obey. So how might we respond to this text? I think we will start right there. We start with that prayer, Lord, change my heart and move my hand. It's a great way to start your day. Put your hand on your heart and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I pray that you would change my heart and move my hand. Now, then part of that, uh, what the the, the Bible calls it in in Galatians chapter 5, keeping in step with the Spirit. Um, It is simply communicating that the people of God, people who follow Jesus, are to follow the lifestyle that Jesus modeled, which is characterized by an, a radical moment by moment awareness. And so the next step is we seek to live in awareness through prayer, through the uh, rhythm of our life and the um, uh, uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us about the speed in which we are living. So, so through prayer and reflect, reflecting on the rhythm of our life and then learning to live a reflective life. That This is how we grow in the Spirit. This is how we cultivate awareness. Sometimes awareness begins with being willing to, in those places of, of prayer, cultivate reflection, live a reflective life. 
And so maybe where we start is we, we don't necessarily, maybe we're not mindful of the opportunities that the Spirit's bringing before us. And so we say, Lord, change my heart and move my hand. Open my eyes. Make me aware. And, and maybe a great place to start is that every night before you go to bed, take a moment to come before the Lord who lives in your soul. So you don't have to go anywhere or seek him out there. He's already here. So you tend to the presence of the Lord that's already, uh, that, that is inward, not out there, but the Lord who exists within you. So you turn inward and you simply pray this prayer, Lord, where did I encounter you today? And, and maybe you learn that you encountered the Lord and you neglected him. Maybe you learn that you encountered the Lord and uh, didn't neglect him, but you didn't in the moment realize that that's what was taking place. But the Holy Spirit makes you aware. I mean, this is the thing about the story in Matthew 25. Those who were ministering to Jesus didn't even realize that they were. So it's not like it's a plan to get favor from God. It, it is simply living the life of the Spirit that is characterized by a consistent compassion. And so maybe that starts with, Lord, where did I encounter you today? I, I love this exercise because it's, I'm not saying I have an epiphany every day, but oftentimes I am taken aback at the little places throughout my day that Jesus disguised himself in the face of the other. And, and sometimes I weep because of my neglect and sometimes I weep tears of joy because of the privilege that I had in ministering to my Lord in such a tangible way. So, so we begin there. Lord, where did I encounter you today? And then very easily, all we do is we begin to live a lifestyle of responding to the needs of those around us. It might be our children. It might be our partner. It doesn't have to be physical needs. Maybe they're emotional needs that are around us. And we simply, we're not fixing anything. Again, these acts aren't acts of compassion that fix situations. They're simply acts that respond to the need that's in front of us. And so, so we don't necessarily live our lives as fixers of others. We, we are simply there to meet whatever physical, spiritual, or emotional or uh, mental needs that they may have. And so it might be our partner, it might be our children, it might be our co-workers, or it might be a stranger that we encounter. We simply begin to cultivate a life of responding to the needs of those around us. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being able to tangibly serve you in the face of the other. We pray that you would empower us to live a more aware and reflective life so that we can see the ways in which you are allowing us to encounter you on a daily basis. Lord, we pray that when, when we reflect upon Cain's rhetor uh, rhetorical question, am I my brother's keeper, that the gospel heart that you've put in us would immediately respond, yes, I am. And I will embrace that responsibility in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, if you've had a moment to go gather your communion elements, this morning I'm using uh, grape juice and a cracker. You can use whatever liquid and food that you have available um, to, um, to take communion with us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you that every week we are reminded that you were willing to be broken so that we might be made whole and we ask that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and the compassion and the power to follow you in obedience and be willing to be broken ourselves so that we can enter into the brokenness of others and be an instrument of healing, reconciliation, and wholeness. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you that the gospel is first and foremost about a new covenant. And it's a new covenant that tells us that our sins have been forgiven. And so we pray that we would have the courage to live like forgiven people and to walk the earth as the pardon of God. Our Lord then poured the wine and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, 
shed for the forgiveness of sins, take and drink in remembrance of me. I'm a stranger here in a foreign land Passing through when will I be home again? You remind me nothing here is permanent But your word and your faithfulness And I was hungry I was thirsty Thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you.